everyone, and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gisela Kay. Thank you so much for your patience while we were just sorting out a couple of things. Really appreciate it. I am very pleased to introduce to you Tom Brennan, Thomas Brennan, who is the PI on Ellen Greenberg's case. Thank you so much for being here and welcome. Thank you very much for the invite. Yes, absolutely. So I'm hoping my audience is familiar with the case because I've covered it before. I have a playlist if you guys haven't seen it. It's in the description box. Um, it's also pinned in the comments here for you if you guys want to see a 20-minute or so episode just covering the, the main points in the case. So I'm hoping they are familiar so we can kind of talk as if they are. But mostly, I know the public's concern is Ellen Greenberg's death has been ruled a suicide. And based on evidence, it seems to make no sense. Are you on the same page? Um, I've been on the same page in, since March of 2013 when I first got involved. Um, I can't understand. Um, there's, there's a basic principle in death investigations throughout law enforcement. And that is the medical examiner makes a determination as to cause and manner of death. In this case, that was not done. Okay, that was done by the police. I have an incident memo by a uniform, made by a uniform officer the night this occurred when he left the scene. And he reports on that incident memo that the decision by homicide and the ME investigator is the case is a suicide. And the report is in, in captions, it's the manner of the incident is suicide. Now, I, as I, one of the first things I did was contact the medical examiner's office when I got involved. At first, um, Dr. Galino, the director, uh, would not permit me to speak with Dr. Marlon Osborne, the pathologist that performed the autopsy. So after about a year, um, once I got Dr. Wayne Ross, a neuroforensic pathologist who I had worked with in the past, once I got him involved, um, I contacted Dr. Galino again, and I had been emailing him, but never getting responses. So I provided him with a copy of Dr. Wayne Ross's report after he, after Dr. Ross viewed uh, a number of the documents that I had. And that was doc it was Dr. Ross's opinion that this was a homicide. So at that time, Dr. Galino emailed me back and he said, since Dr. Osborne and Dr. and Dr. Ross are medical professionals, he would permit a conference call. So um, we had a date and a time and we had a conference call. And the conference call originated from the um, Dauphin County Coroner's Office that that uh, supports Dauphin County here in Harrisburg. And present was myself, Dr. Ross, and the coroner, Dauphin County Coroner, Graham Hetrick. Uh, Doc, Graham Hetrick didn't, didn't uh, question Dr. Osborne. Dr. Ross did, and Dr. Ross was not completely satisfied with the responses that he received from Dr. Osborne. And then when Dr. Ross finished, I began to question Dr. Osborne. And my last question to Dr. Osborne was, why would you change the cause and manner of death, in this case, from homicide to suicide? And he said, I did it at the insistence of the police. And I said, since when do the, who in the, the police has a degree in pathology? Since when do they 
make the call on cause and manner of death. And with that, the call ended. Wow. So, you know, and then if you take a look at the de depositions almost 10 years later, okay, or nine or 10 years later, and Dr. Osborne and Dr. Galino, okay, um, Dr. Osborne is basically saying in his deposition, um, well, I, had I known all of these facts that you have produced to date, I would have considered changing it. But the city of Philadelphia will not, seems like they won't let that happen. That's so odd. So, you know, it's, it, and that's the big why. Why have they, why has the city of Philadelphia yeah. dug their heels in, you know, over this case? It could have been resolved very easily right at the beginning by someone saying, okay, we're going to change it to undetermined and we'll do a, a, legitimate, a legitimate death investigation because there was no legitimate death investigation done at the scene at, when this occurred none and um you know and, and the things that occurred uh that took place uh why why a police department would allow such things to happen and why the city of philadelphia would support that kind of behavior is beyond me. Yes. Because I have served in the state police with the FBI Behavioral Science Unit. I served as chief of Dauphin County detectives in the local in the local police departments. And I had never ever experienced that in my entire career. I mean, this scene was never ever protected. The first individual through the door, okay, of the apartment that evening after the 911 call was an EMS um, fireman. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did they ever, he's the one that pronounced Ellen. Did they ever interview him? No. Wow. Okay. Hmm. And, and, you know, a simple thing like that. The first individual through the door that pronounced the victim. Yes. Okay. And that, and that individual remarked to his lieutenant that, that, that evening as they left, we, we should go back to the station because homicide is going to want to interview us. And when I, when I spoke with him, he said, I asked him, I said, did homicide ever interview you? He said, no. He said, I've never heard from him. Oh, my word. Now I heard they haven't uh, interviewed Ellen's psychiatrist and now not the first person who was on the scene. So who did they interview? They they said that they did. They knocked on other occupants' doors. And um, that was it. We don't know exactly what they did because... They've refused to give us access to any police reports. Man. Okay, we're going to get to that now. Just quickly, I see some people in the audience are not too sure about the case. They didn't check that episode. You guys, if you check the playlist, you'll learn about it there. But this is Ellen Greenberg. This is the case we're talking about. Ellen Greenberg was, and this is Gavin Fish's site, by the way. I'll link it as well, gavinfish.com. He's done some excellent work on this case and worked very closely with the family too. Ellen Greenberg was a 27-year-old first grade teacher at Juanita Park Academy in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, at approximately 6.40 p.m. on January 26, 2011. That's when this case is from, you guys. Ellen was pronounced dead as a result of 20 stab wounds, including 10 to the back of her head and neck. 
In addition, there were 11 bruises in various stages of resolution on her right arm, abdomen, and right leg. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, the medical examiner, Dr. Marlon Osborne, as you can hear we're mentioning here, uh, ruled her death as a suicide. He later admitted that he had originally planned on ruling the manner of death either a homicide or undetermined, but changed it to suicide at the insistence of the police. So that's what we're looking at there. If you want a deep dive on the case, I would recommend Gavin Fisher's site. He's got photos of Ellen. He's got documents. If you got, you know, we'll have documents. Uh, sorry for those pictures as well, if you do want to see it. But here, look at all these documents that he's got here too. Okay, so now that you guys know a little bit about the case, uh, I hope you will check out the other episodes so that you can really know the injustice that seems to be going on here. I mean, what? why? I know you also asked why, but why? The um in in the the case uh, the case that we have now that's under appeal by the city because the two previous um the pr two previous cases um they appealed okay so now they're on their third appeal okay to a higher court the a sitting judge in Philadelphia who heard the first two two cases wrote a 16-page opinion on why we should be able to take this court to this case to trial. And they the city keeps appealing, 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 hoping that they're going to get a ruling from some court in their favor. And they keep saying that. If they if, if they let this go, the floodgates will open and a number of cases will be will be appealed. Well, if if there are that many cases that have the abhorrent police behavior in investigation as this one does, the city is damn well in in a lot of a lot of a lot of trouble, <laughs> a lot of trouble. And and uh, you know, like I said, I have I've never and I I have worked cases all over the United States, Canada, Germany, Israel, uh, the UK, France. Criminal behavior transcends culture. An asshole over here is an asshole over there. Okay? They may talk differently, they may dress differently, but that behavior is the same. And and I I can't understand. I have, you know, in the most uh uh rural or, or most untrained police departments like in Guatemala or things, I, I've never seen I've never seen police behavior like this. I refer to this case as a case of not enough litter in the box. No matter how much they keep scratching around, it's still going to stink. <laughs> and yeah, it, it uh, you know, it, it's to put parents through what they have put Sandy and Josh, the parents of Ellen through is unconscionable. It's yes. unconscionable. Hmm. And and what occurred that night, okay, that first night, did when 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 they removed Ellen for autopsy, did they secure the apartment? No. The uniform officer that was on the door. I learned left. So the door was un it was not secure. That next morning, the fiance's uncle called to see if he could enter the apartment to get the fiance a suit for the funeral. Well, the the property manager said, Well, I have to call the police. So she called a homicide. Philly, Philly homicide. And they said, yeah, you can allow them in. And she said, well, it's all bloody. 
the scene is all bloody. He said, well, he said, that's not our problem. That's your problem or the renter's problem. But you can call crime scene cleanups and they'll send somebody out and clean up the scene. So that's the next day. So that's the morning of later in the morning of January 27th. So the property manager calls crime scene cleanups. They send two women over. But before the women get there, the property manager and uh, the maintenance supervisor take a video of the entire apartment so they could use the video if they had to for, to protect their own company. So while the apartment is being cleaned and sanitized, Ellen's autopsy is taking place. Okay. Yes. yes. So following the cleaning of, and sanitizing of the crime scene, the police receive a call, homicide receives a call from the medical examiner's office saying, Dr. Osborne findings say this is a this is a homicide. Then it's a big ah, uh, you know what? So now that's the 27th. Guess who shows up the 28th with a search warrant? Because since the scene was not protected, okay, the police show up on the 28th. But on the 27th, prior to the uncle leaving the scene, the prominent attorney uncle, he takes the victim's laptop, her work laptop, and the fiance's laptop, and the victim's phone, her credit cards, etc., with him. So what does that do to the chain of evidence on those items? Right. That's what I'm wondering. That's not, is that the normal, is that the normal, I'll ask a question like this. Is that the normal procedure to do for like the next of kin? Cause Ellen was engaged to Sam Goldberg. No. Is that normal? Okay. <coughs> and excuse me. And I've since learned that the police at the scene did not we're not aware of the stab wounds, the 6.5 centimeter wound to the side of her scalp or the stab wounds to the back of the neck. That was all learned at the time of autopsy. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the police made a decision on suicide and didn't even know the totality of the wounds on the victim. Oh, man. So now you have an unprotected scene that's been cleaned and sanitized. And now the police show up on the morning of the, or on the 28th with a search warrant to process the scene. What the hell are they going to get from a, a yeah. clean and sanitized scene? The only possibility would have been a, um, a luminol to see if they could you know, identify any blood, but they didn't even do that. Wow. And who ordered the, the crime scene cleanup crew? When the police said, you know, the police told the property manager, Hey, that, that scene is not our problem. It's yours. She's the one that called crime scene cleanups and had them come over and, and clean and sanitize the, the apartment before wow. the uncle entered oh man so and she would have then paid for it i assume because you know order that paid it and then it's done already the next day you know the rental company paid for it wow that was so quick if you guys are following the story this uh happened ellen died on january 26 2011 and on the 27th there was already a whole crime scene cleanup crew and then by the 28th the police had a search warrant they went into the apartment, but already by then they'd said she died from suicide, which that really, just based on what I know, it just sounds a bit like victim blaming, and we don't like that over here. 
it's like she did it to herself, but it seems it seems impossible based on I'm not a medical expert. So you guys disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer or a medical expert. It's just from what I'm reading. I'm like, it doesn't seem possible to stab yourself 20 times, especially at the back of the I neck had, and head. Uh, once we had the digital analysis done. Yes. Uh, uh, I had a uh, and, and with Dr. Ross, we. Uh, I got the assistance of a um, a female police officer, the approximate weight and height of the victim, who was in perfect physical condition, and had her attempt. And I had a sim. I I I had access to a similar knife. And I had her attempt to do the do the same thing as they allege the victim did. And she, she found it impossible to do. That's the problem, man. Because they're saying, you know, Ellen, I don't know, the Google searches also came out at some point, which I think wasn't part of the case file, but they're saying based on her searches and her medications, she did this to herself and she had no defensive wounds. But they described in one episode, this could have been something like a blitz attack, you like know, really suddenly. Yes, um, that that. I, I said, uh, people have asked me my opinion, and I said, yes. it, it was evidently a blitz attack. She never had okay. the opportunity to, to defend herself. But if you take a look at the autopsy photographs where the wrists are excised, you'll see there is trauma and there is hemorrhaging. Okay. So there are wounds and there are, is bruising on her hands and wrists. No. Oh. Okay. So for anybody to say there was a lack of defense wounds is is bullshit. Uh -huh. okay? And the same thing they say about this. Well, she was on multiple multiple antidepressants and she had this horrible case of anxiety. She was diagnosed with a case of anxiety which I have, you probably have. Yes. My husband probably has, okay? A mild case of anxiety. That's what she was diagnosed with. I wish people would quit saying she had this horrible case of anxiety. She was diagnosed with a mild case of anxiety. Mm -hmm. We had a behavioral health expert take a look at the medications and take a look at the conversations that she had with her friends and mother and the, the, uh, the amount of medication that she, she from the time she picked the, the prescriptions up until they were, they were uh, taken by the medical examiner's investigator there was no misuse, okay? And the toxicology report, if you look at the toxicology report, she was not under the influence of anything, mm -hmm. okay? She was not abusing any drugs. She was not abusing the prescriptions that she was diagnosed with, that she, that she had been uh, scripted for. So all of this, you know, you know, like I say, bullshit, especially with what the investigation of the state attorney general's office is, comes, comes up with, the shadow searches, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay? And they didn't even know what they, you know, if they, I don't, first of all, I don't believe an, unless and until they provide me with a copy of that report. I'm going to say they're lying. They're lying about the forensic analysis that they claim they did. Oh, man. Until okay. I see that report. Okay? Yes. Because there were certain documents given to a reporter, Stephanie Farr, who did the first article on this case 
for the Philadelphia Inquirer from the Attorney General's office. Those documents, I know, came from a report. That report, that forensic analysis, was performed Mr. Larry Krasner, okay, who was the parents, Josh and Sandy's first attorney, civil attorney, prior to me getting involved. When he received the electronics back from the police, okay, after they did their testing, they sent it to an FBI lab, and the FBI lab came back and said, excuse me, that they found nothing related to suicide. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So then, <coughs> once Mr. Krasner got access to the laptops, he sent Ellen's personal laptop to a company in North Carolina to do another forensic analysis. That's where they came up with these shadow searches. Now, these are searches that if you you went out and you looked up Ambien, there's a number of different sites that you that come up that you, you know you didn't look for. Like, um, does it cost you? Does it will it? You know, can it cost suicide? Mm -hmm. or, you know, things like that. So. They were recognized as shadow searches. Well, the one of the one of the first things I did was when I got involved is I had Mr. Doctor I had Dr. Greenberg inform his attorney, Mr. Krasner, to provide me with a copy of that forensic analysis. Okay. That what the results of that so there were two people that had copies of that report that was myself and mr krasner okay mm -hmm. now how did the ag's office produce copies similar to that report mm -hmm. well when mr krasner became da in Philadelphia, he had to recuse himself and send the files, send the files to the investigative files to the attorney general's office. I believe he also sent the Greenberg's personal file. Interesting. And one of the things that I had the Greenberg's do was send a letter to Mr. Krasner when he became DA and ask them for his for their personal file. He said he gave it to them. They said they never received it. Wow. So where is their personal file? Yes, where is it? And I mean, I believe that they say the case is how closed. Did, how did this report? Where's the stuff? Yeah. How did this report? Okay. So... Unless and until the attorney general's office gives me a copy of the report that they say was done by the FBI, okay, I would say they're a liar. I would call them liars. And how long have you been waiting for that report or for that proof? Oh, uh, about five years. Five years. Man. When I met, when I, I, I met with uh, members of the Attorney General's office, okay, and what everybody has to understand, the same people that reviewed this case in the Philadelphia DA's office in their homicide prosecution unit are the same people the same attorneys that were now that are now in the attorney general's office. Yes, I was. Re is that so someone called Christopher Phillips, Mr. Phillips? Mr. Phillips 
Jennifer Selber, mm -hmm. Kristen Hein. Okay, they're all. They were all in the Philadelphia DA's office. Okay. Okay. So now they're in the attorney general's office and, and Krasner recuses himself and sends them the file. Why in the hell they didn't recuse themselves right at the beginning and say, hey, whoa, we were there when these decisions were made. You know, we made these decisions. So we can't, we can't be involved in this. Mm -hmm. Oh, did they? No. Wow. So where is the case right now? Like, where is it standing right now? We have, um, we have filed two different cases. The one case, um, which the city appealed is our original, our original filing to have the cause and manner of death changed to either homicide or undetermined. Okay. The other is as a result of our investigation, um, we're alleging that there's a conspiracy to uh, cover up this homicide. So that's a civil, civil, civil case. They're both civil cases. Okay. So, um, and we have them filed. We have uh, we've named. Uh, we named an individual from the district attorney's office. We named um, uh, Dr. Osborne and Dr. Galino and Dr. Emery. Dr. Emery um, is the individual who uh, we we uh, we learned that there were specimens still being held in wound specimens still being held in a piece of the victim's spinal cord at the medical examiner's office yes i was reading about that i i, I hope i get it right but i think you said dr rourke con she did some dr rourke <laughs> apparently did tests but then it turned out to not be dr rourke like they used that name but she turned out to not know anything about the case and didn't invoice anything in the uh, when we first when I first began this in, in this investigation, um, when I reviewed the autopsy report, there's a paragraph in the autopsy report that states, Dr. Lucy Rourke Adams reviewed, did uh, examine the spinal cord specimen, and it was her opinion that the, the uh, wound was not significant enough and the victim could continue to harm herself. Okay, that paragraph is in, yes. in the autopsy report. Well, I contacted Dr. Lucy Rourke Adams and she said, yeah, Tom, uh, I'm going in for back, back surgery and when I come back, there's going to, there's an extensive rehabs, rehab uh, therapy. So when I'm done, uh, just call me and we'll get together. I said, okay. So I waited uh, almost seven months and eight months. And I, ca I called Dr. Rourke Adams and she said, Tom, I've been reading about this since I've been off and I'm sorry, but there isn't anything that, for you and I to discuss because I had nothing to do with this case. I said, what do you mean? She said, I don't recall the case. And if I had anything to do with the case, I would have submitted a report and an invoice for my work. And uh, she said, have you found a report? I said, no, the report doesn't exist. And she said, what about an invoice? I said, an invoice for your work doesn't exist. There are reports and invoices prior to the 26th and there are reports and invoices after the 27th. So, and <coughs> God bless him, uh, an individual that, I don't know, people seem to forget about. 
is an individual who was a, an assistant district attorney in the Philadelphia homicide unit in the DA's office when this, when this first began. And I befriended him and he said, well, he would see if he could he get permission to take a look at the case. So he approached, guess who? Jennifer Selber, who was in charge of the Philadelphia Homicide Prosecution Unit and asked her if he could take a look at the case. And she said, yeah. So he said, Tom, <coughs> I found the case in a closet covered up with Christmas decorations. And there wasn't even a file number attached to it. And he said it was way from all the other homicide cases. So uh, he said he spent the next two days organizing the file. And he said, when you get access to it, he said, my yellow sticky should be all over it. He said, but one of the things I noted when I first began taking a look at the case was uh, Dr. Lucy Rourke, at Rourke, at Rourke Adams uh, comment in the autopsy report. He said, so I called the police and I said, hey, I don't have a copy of that report. Uh, send me a copy over. They said, we don't have it. So he called the medical examiner's office and he said, they told him, he, he said, when he called there, they said, it doesn't exist. So that paragraph, which they tried to insert in the autopsy report to justify the change from homicide to suicide is fraudulent. It's a lie. Okay. So, um, and uh, Guy D'Andrea, the assistant assistant attorney, he was a assistant attorney, uh, district attorney at the time. He said that he, he was he when he was through, uh, he uh, he informed uh, Jennifer Solbo that he he was in his opinion this was a homicide. And he still, till this day, says that in his opinion. Now, he reviewed the entire file. This is a prosecution attorney with a lot of experience. It's a big file. He reviewed, reviewed the entire file and said, this is a homicide. Now, God bless him. You know, people, people have sort of forgotten about Guy D'Andrea. I mean, now this is an, an extremely, extremely important witness. Extremely important witness. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and uh, you know, th these are the things that, you know, we've experienced over the years regarding this case. A and, um, you know, and uh, have they ever the Philadelphia Police Department, the District Attorney's Office, the uh, Attorney General's Office, have they ever said that they would sit down with Josh and Sandy and go over their findings? No. Oh, man. No. They won't even meet with Josh and Sandy. Now, Dr. Galino finally relented and sat down and all Sandy and Josh asked him to do was to perform the tests necessary on the wound specimens. That's when Dr. Uh, uh, Lindsay Emery, uh, Dr. Galino, approached her to perform the examinations. Okay. Why would you instruct when you told her to examine these specimens? 
Why would you instruct her not to submit a report when she's an employee and all of her other work she justifies and she documents on a report? Why would you tell her to examine these and not submit a report? And in during the deposition, she tells, she says in the deposition that Dr. Galino said that he would include her findings in his overall report. She was asked by Mr. Pedraza, the, our, our, our attorney that's representing us, who is a real, a, a real, you know, he, God bless him. He's a, he's a real, he's really got a set, which is, <laughs> which is good. It's necessary in Philadelphia. But um, Mr. Pedraza, when uh, he at, when he was questioning her, he asked her about, you know, why, why wouldn't you document like you document any other? She said, I was instructed by Dr. Galino not to submit a report. And she, he said, did you ever see his report? And she said, did, do you know if he submitted a report? She said, I don't know. So, you know, it's, yeah. It's like I said, it's, I, I mean, you have people out there that are actually on the urge of committing other crimes to avoid, you know, saying that this is undetermined or a homicide. I mean, even undetermined, I believe the family has been fighting for, even for them to just say, okay, undetermined, rather yeah. than she did it to herself. Well, wow. it's, you know, like I said, you know, to, to put, to put the parents of Ellen through what they've been through the last almost 13 years, you know, it is unconscionable. You know, if there's a place in hell, you know, these people, there's a lot of people going to fill it up. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's not just one. It sounds like a few. And just disclaimer, guys, this is not my opinion. I'm just trying to understand the case, right? So yeah. I'm yeah. trying to then, do my best then, here. Since then, I've learned that. Sure, this. Is it possible that the police yeah. have influenced findings, death find, you know, manner and cause of death in other cases? Yes. That's, there's, is it? Okay. There's a good possibility that that went on. Oh, man. I'm so, just showing some pictures there. Um, if you guys, I will put the link for you if you do want to learn lots about the case on this website. Okay. Thank you all for being here. I hope that you're learning something about the case. But mostly we want to know what can we do to help? What you can do to help is, number one, sign the petition if you can. Um, uh, Mr. Shapiro, who, who was the state attorney general, is now our governor. Um, uh, so uh, even if you can write letters to the governor. Okay. Writing this case, you know, I've, I've tried to uh, get to him on Twitter and email and uh, he's never responded to me. But uh, uh, sign the petition, and uh, there's a GoFundMe uh, uh, place where you can make make a, a, a small donation to assist the parents in uh, the. There's a lot of legal fees connected with this case. Um, there's been a lot of uh, there's been expenses that that. That I've I've had I've had to uh, I I've had to get them to support yes um, things like the uh, um, digital analysis that was done okay and if if anyone you know anyone I, I, any rookie or <laughs> anyone new to homicide takes a look at that digital analysis of the wounds yes we've got. I mean, got it, yeah. and um, then you find 
you find that, you know, one of the other things that I, when I first began looking uh, at the autopsy report and I recognized that there were bruises in, on the body in different stages of aging. The That's first a red thing flag. that comes to mind is she was being abused. Now this is a this is a child who uh, was had was cohabitating with her fiance for about two and a half years, and had just sent out save the dates for her wedding inv set invitations. And she calls mom and dad and says, I want to come home. Why? Mm -hmm. It's not because I spoke with the, uh, you know, uh, teachers that worked with her, uh, worked with Ellen, and they said that she was a beautiful person. Um, there was, wasn't any problem with the, her being behind and, her, you know, posting grades or the kid, the children loved her. Um, everybody thought she was wonderful. Um, they couldn't, none of them could understand how this could possibly happen. And no one knew, no one knew, none of her fellow workers knew that she wanted to go home. She wanted, to, that she wanted to quit her job and go home. There's only that one, I read somewhere that she had a friend that she was also saying to her, the friend is about 10 years older than her. I think she was in, yes. you know, uniform childhood, just saying that she wants to go home as well. And she noticed a bit of a behavior change. It just, it doesn't seem like the, the narrative that's out there means possibly, you know, feeling a little more sad. It could be, it could be something like domestic violence going on um, with the bruises. Do you know how far back those bruises date? They... All they said were in the autopsy report was that it was in the different stages, different stages of aging. Yes. Okay. And they said that it could be from yoga or Pilates, right? Yes. Okay. You know, like I okay. said, what do they, they practice in combat Pilates? <laughs> combat Pilates, right? Your camera froze for a second there. Well, it's freezing yes. now. I don't know what. I don't know what happened here. We can hear you, but we can't see you. Yes. Like as in yeah, your camera <laughs> is just frozen there. <laughs> yes. I don't know what happened. Hmm. I don't know how to fix that either. Um, but in the meantime, let me show them this justice for Ellen Page. If you guys do want to um, check this out, this is the official page to follow um, all the links for in the case. Uh, and thank you so much to them uh, for posting this on there as well. Really appreciate it. Always know that families watching you guys, family, friends, we are here as Team Ellen. So we're not here to blame anyone or point fingers or red flag. We just want to know what's going on, what happened, because we want to fight for justice for Ellen, because it just really seems like... Do you mind if I show them those pictures? I could see you again now. Yes. No. So you guys, trigger warning, okay? So I've shown it to you, I think, in a member stream before. So trigger warning. But it's called, this is called photogrammetry, right? It's this 3D illustration that was done to show how the injuries were caused. So good luck to me on YouTube. Let's hope YouTube doesn't take the stream down. Okay. But it, like this, like you could just see, like, how is someone going to do this to themselves? And then, you know, the one thing that worries me about the, the 911 call is that only later when there was the instruction to perform CPR was the knife noticed in her chest. That and was if, you, if you take a look at, you know, study the depictions here. Okay. Yes. The trajectory on those wounds. Okay. Are all different. Are all different. It's like, okay. That's why I said, right from the beginning, that with this case, there's a lot of staging, what we refer to as staging mm -hmm. going on. They're making, trying to make it look like a suicide. Wow. Okay. So I don't believe, as Dr. Lindsay Emery said, 
about the one wound mm -hmm. okay that she examined that was post-mortem inflicted after death yes yes how many of these other wounds you know if we would have had specific how many of these other wounds were inflicted post-mortem yes probably more than one it's it, so sad i believe it's all part of the staging that was done to make it look like a, a suicide but even her body being upright and then there she had sorry you guys i know this is very hectic again but like blood on her cheek it shows that her body was moved right as in right. staged right wow that is quite something and two different knives were apparently used yes and the one knife has not been found yes the smooth bladed knife has not been found wow these are all very very troubling things so also the white towel in her left hand that is such a weird thing that she, there's the scene and it's bloody and it's terrible but there's this white towel in her right hand that's I odd think, i think it's 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 uh all part of the staging to make it look like you know she used that towel to put over the knife oh yeah to, you know plunge it into her chest um can you imagine the force that it takes to penetrate where that knife mm -hmm. penetrated? You know, that's not done by an individual that suffered the wounds that, that Ellen suffered. Yes, yes. And, you know, and, and, and to, to, to have the knowledge, to, for a parent to have the knowledge of what their child experienced is, you know, I, 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 you know, people say, well, Tom, you've, you've done over 800 of these, you know, I said, if, if I, I'm sorry, when the day comes that it doesn't bother me, okay, that's the day, you know, then I, then I'll quit and, and, uh, you know, tell my therapist, Hey, you know, I'm done. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. But I'm sure this must keep you up at night. It must be frustrating. And just also to see, as you say, how the parents of Ellen, this was their only child. If you guys didn't know, this was their only child. Yeah. Ellen Greenberg, 27 years old. I mean, even the anxiety, I was thinking, because her wedding was coming up in August, that would cause anxiety in itself. Yes. And I've, I've, yeah. I've even talked to uh, uh, journalists, young journalists that have said, Tom, I experienced you know, I experienced the the same thing. I'm I'm getting married, and I'm experiencing the same thing, the same type of anxiety. What's the what? You know. You know, uh, am I going to kill myself? No. I never even thought of that. You know, even her psychiatrist, who prescribed her medications, said she was not suicidal. Mm hmm. And she was getting better. Yes, and she was also texting her mom to say she was feeling better and getting better. Yes. And she, the same thing with her friends. Mm -hmm. You know, the friends that I interviewed, she said that, you know, she talked to them and texted them and saying that she was, the clonopin was working and it, she was feeling a lot better. I find it interesting how... Mm, let me say defensive the police and everyone is because what if if one were to play devil's advocate if it was the sixth floor apartment i know there were no footprints in the snow but what if it was someone else you know what i mean that it would be an investigation to look into even to say an undetermined cause of death rather than suicide open the investigation and then rule out suspects right right why would you make why you know, the bottom line being, where do the police come off making yeah. a ruling of suicide prior to autopsy? That's so odd. <laughs> it's really and baffling. They, and they didn't know about the wounds, the, the, the wound to the side of the scalp or the stab wounds to the back of the neck. Wow. You know, and then, like I said, they 
to date, we have not had access to any reports. That's what I'm saying. They say case closed, but you don't have access to all the information. Right. So, you know, and in the state of Pennsylvania, you know, suicide is not a crime. The case is closed. Why don't we have access to the, you know, the reports? Exactly. What are they trying to hide? Hmm. What are not, you know, what are they hiding and why? Yes. And why? Exactly. And, and, and the politics involved in this from the different entities, from the district, from the police, from the different, from uh, the district attorney's office, the attorney general's office. And now since, what is this? It's now May. Five months in the in the in the uh, Chester County District Attorney's Office. I mean, I'm sorry, but if it takes you five year five months to go through a file, you really have a problem. <laughs> and this, you know, I'd like to see the size of that, to the size of this investigative file. Yes, exactly. I can't um, wait. I can't wait. Yeah. And do you know if the fiance did he have any enemies? Did he have anyone, you know, that could anyone else that could, or did you see the surveillance from the whole day to rule out if anyone else had come into the building or anyway? We have only had limit a limited amount of access to the security cameras. There were no cameras in the halls where the apartments were. Okay. So there were there were cameras in the lobby of the apartments and in certain places throughout, throughout the, the apartment complex. But, um, uh, the video that we have, um, uh, in the supposed statement of the, uh, fiance, he said that the concierge accompanied him to the, to his apartment and was there when he made entry. Mm -hmm. okay. I interviewed the concierge and I have a sworn statement from him, a declaration from him stating that he never ever accompanied the fiance when he broke into the supposedly made entry into the apartment. Oh man. Okay. Why he would say that? I don't know. The concierge said that he came to him, a, a, you know, one, uh, two or three different times. And he just kept telling him, hey, it's against company policy. I can't do I can't do that. And if you break in the door, you're going to be responsible for the damages. Yeah. So, you know, and then to come to find out later on, you know, that he's on the phone calling his prominent attorney uncle and his in this prominent attorney uncle's son and they're advising him about what to do and that comes from the attorney that represents the prominent attorney uncle the fiance and and uh, uh, the son the prominent attorney uncle's son, okay, saying, okay, now they won't speak to me, but if your attorney is saying you guys are on the phone advising the fiance about what to do, what the hell were you advising him? Mm -hmm. What's the advice that you gave him? What was he saying to you? You know? Uh, Man. That those are the things I want to I, I, I want to get these people. I would I want to see these people on a stand under oath. So we can question them. And the I, question I, is, why I do they protect present. him? Yeah, I'm why? Not. Well, like my question is, why? If if that's the case, guys, and again, I'm just asking questions, right? If that's the case, why are they why would they protect 
the fiance so much to this level? Oh, I that uh, you know, I'm not saying that this the fiance is responsible for this in any way. Okay. Me neither. Well, my focus is on the cause and manner of death. Yes, yes, yes. But I'll be. <laughs> I will make that leap once we get a decision and once I get access to those police reports. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, I've made several attempts to talk to the fiance, and that you know it hasn't happened. Um, and uh, and even uh, journalist Stephanie Farr, when she did her report for the uh, Inquirer, she texted him, she emailed him, she went. He's now living in a two two million dollar apartment in Manhattan. Oh, whoa, okay. Okay. And um, she even got past his doorman and slipped a note under his door, a letter under his door, and never got a response. Okay. Now, this is the woman you love. This is the woman that you were going to marry. Okay. And when it comes to doing CPR, you ask, Do I have to? (laughs) And then you kneel down and you go, ah, shit. Okay. But we'll, you know, what I'd what I want to see happen is for Sandy and Josh to be successful in court in getting the manner and cause of death changed on their child. And then we go from there. Yes. And do you think it's going to happen? Is there hope? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There's there's other courts left. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and, and the fight they have in them, God bless them. Uh, you know, they're never, they're, they'll never give up. They will never yes. give up. Yes. I've seen them on, on lots of interviews and shows, and they have that same resilience, determination, fighting for Ellen. It's amazing. And they have a they have a lot of people, people like witnesses like like Guy D'Andrea, okay, and and, and others, uh, even 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 people from that that have you know that I have befriended that that you know if I know I know that if the information that they provided me with if if they were known for it, there was, there's going to be some retaliation. Okay. Interesting. So, you know, um, but they're all willing. They are all willing that once this case goes to court and we have the opportunity to present our evidence. Okay. In a courtroom. They said they will be there. Wow. So we look forward to that. So, you know, I, I and and uh you know when you have when you have medical professionals, okay, under dep- you know, in deposition that are sworn, that have taken an oath, okay, and for them to lie. You know, there has to be some. There, there has there there has to be consequences for that. There has to be consequences. Mm-hmm. Okay, when Doctor Galino says, "I, I hired Doctor Osborne. Doctor Osborne is one of the finest, and he, he gloats over his performances and everything, and he's never been disciplined and everything." And Dr. Osborne says the same thing, gives a glowing report about his performance. And then I come up with three memos where the deputy director, who is now a state medical examiner, okay, where I come up with three memos chastising Dr. Osborne for his piss poor performance. <laughs> And even in one of the memos, he's chastised for missing 
manual strangulation on a victim, on a homicide victim. And guess what? On this victim, he missed the same thing. Oh, man. You know, this is the kind of bullshit we've had to put up with. For many years, yes. Yes. That's why I can't wait. I can't wait for the day to come when we can break it off in them all. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I just know that our community, we've got uh, Ellen's family, friends, we've got your back. We want to support you. We want to sign the petition. We want to contact who you want us to contact the state attorney general, maybe the director of the medical office in Philadelphia. Yes. We want to kick up a fuss just just to to be like, well, there are eyes. We are still looking at it. It's it's many years later. This happened in 2011. In case you guys are only joining the stream now, and here we are in 2023, and you and you are fired any, up if, like day one. Way, if there's any way that 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 Josh and Sandy can get any 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 financial support, it would be would be greatly appreciated. Greatly appreciated. Yes, and you also you do this pro bono, right? Yes. Wow. Okay. Damn. Um, so I will make sure the link, I haven't found that link yet, but I'm going to share all the links in the description box. You guys, we've got on Twitter, on Facebook, we've got the, the GoFundMe, the petition, everything. Most importantly, please do sign that petition. I did show it here earlier as well. Let's get those signatures up. Let's see how many we've got exactly now. Uh, 154,410. Okay. So let's, if you just make sure you sign your first name, last name, email, and remember to click the link in your inbox so that it counts your vote. So please go sign there. The petition, I'll put it in the chat now. It is also in the description box. Okay. So that's a good place to start as well. And then all the other links I'll put in the description box for everyone. That, that would be great. That would be great. And, you know, I can't thank you enough for your, for your, your kindness and um, your support. Yes, we want to, I mean, especially now it must feel frustrating is the least of it, draining and just like, oh, is anyone listening? Well, yes, the world is listening. There's a lot of, I know YouTube, I mean, I also know YouTubers can get sued, YouTubers for saying things, but we're asking questions here, right? We just want to know yes. what's happening. We want to fight for Ellen. So we all team Ellen, your team Ellen. We want to be with her family and just show, don't worry. We know it's been a long time, but we've got your back. Thank you, Baruka. So... I really hope, I can't wait actually to see that day when you're in court. <laughs> Hopefully we can see that and like, okay, even undetermined, please. But homicide would be, it seems the most appropriate, but yes. even undetermined, but not suicide. That's sad. It's yeah. really terrible. There isn't any reason in the world that anyone, anyone with any common sense yeah. that doesn't <laughs> even have any homicide experience right, would ever consider this a, 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 a suicide you know it's just it's just unimaginable i've never seen anyone actually agree with that <laughs> you know you know i've never seen anyone cover the case and go no but it seems like it could be <laughs> it just can't <laughs> right you know that's never you know in, in uh, like i said i've been in, involved in this since march of 2013 i have yet to find the person that has a harsh word to say about Ellen Ray Greenberg. Yeah. I have yet, okay, to meet the person that says, yeah, I believe this is a suicide. That will be an interesting, <laughs> an interesting discussion. Like how, how does someone 20 times, you guys, she was stabbed 20 times with possibly two different knives. That's what they say. Like, you do that to yourself after making you're busy making fruit salad and then the blueberries one, are there you know the one question i got from the opposition well you can pay experts to say anything <sighs> and i really put them in their place when i say you know no one no one ever got paid for any of this until we started going to court yes so experts who first got involved in it, like Dr. Ross. Dr. Ross was not being paid. Okay. Henry Lee did not get paid. There was a small, a small donation made to his institute, but Henry Lee never made any money of this. 
the detective Eshelman. He was never paid anything for his opinion. And what there's another thing that, that people don't realize. There is a crime investigative analyst in Florida, okay, that goes around training forensic forensics units for poli in police departments. I had to speak with her regarding a different homicide. When I met with her, she said to me, you know, Tom, there's another case, you know, and I was saying that this case that I, I was, I said was, I was meeting her with, I said, it, it's a homicide, it's not a suicide. And it involved a 17 year old. And we, we got finished our discussion and she said to me, you know, Tom, I was just approached about another case in Philadelphia. I said, you were? I said, what, what's that about? And she said, it involved a school teacher. She was stabbed 20 times, 20 times, 10 times in the back of the neck. I said, yeah. She said, and they said it was suicide. She said, a sergeant in the Philadelphia Forensics Unit presented her with the photographs of the scene. And he wanted her opinion. And she said, I told him, uh, in my opinion, it's a homicide. And I said to her, is the victim's name Ellen Ray Greenberg? And she said, yeah, why? How do you know? I said, well, I just got involved in that case. I said, I just, I said, I'm waiting for copies of the reports. And she said, oh my God, Tom, you got to do something. You have to do something. That's a homicide. That's not a suicide. You got to do something. I said, give me that sergeant's name. She said, I can't. She said, I can't because he'll lose his job. If people find out that, you know, he talked to me, he'll lose his job. Yeah. I said, okay, but there'll come a day. There'll come a day when you'll see me with the subpoena and you <laughs> will give me that name. <laughs> right you're not giving up anytime soon yeah you're gonna know exactly wow it's i mean the thing that bothers me most is that if it really seems that she did not do this to herself then that means there's a killer out there why are they not worried about that yes you know yes. that's a scary thought that is that is to be you know even even to do the staging that's necessary okay in this crime scene the you know to make to attempt to make it look like a suicide mm -hmm. could you imagine stabbing an individual who is already dead several times with a knife and then plunging the knife in her chest to make it look like a suicide because if this one in the back of the neck, okay, is post-mortem, how the hell did she do this? Exactly. There's no way. So if this is post-mortem, this is post-mortem. Yes. But even that shows it's quite a sophisticated killer then because there's staging and calculation and all that so that's scary because that means <laughs> true crime guys red flag there's a killer out there we that's don't know who scary. it is but they're out there and that could pose that is a, a risk to others mm -hmm. that's very concerning so we want justice for ellen she didn't do this to herself and we want to make sure everyone else is safe too yes 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 that's that should be the priorities of the, the concern that we would hope that the police and Everyone, the medical examiners you would, you have. Would think, you would think. <laughs> yes. Because what if it was their daughter? Or what if they yes. have daughters and this person goes after them? Yes. Oh, that is so scary. Man. Okay. Yeah, Amber says, I smell rats here. Yep. <laughs> A little bit. Yes. So this case is very upsetting, you guys. Very. So make sure you sign the petition. 
Uh, go to Justice for Ellen on all it's Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, everywhere as well. And I'll make sure to put any other links. Um, is there an official website at all, or is it all Justice for Ellen on social media? Justice for Ellen. Justice yeah. for Ellen. Okay, I'm gonna be. I'll share everything as soon as you guys know. I do timestamps and everything, and I'll put it all in the description box for you. All right, great. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here with us and sharing all of this thank with you. us. Thank so, you. Thank you for your interest and support. Yes, and please send our love to Ellen's family too. I hope they know That's we support true. them. We uh, watch all the episodes everywhere they go. We watch it I'm all. Sure, <laughs> I'm sure they're they're watching. I'm sure okay. they're watching. Okay. We're sending lots of love to them. Um, this community is very proactive. We get all fired up and we want to just be the energy now. Just like, okay, right. let's go. Okay. Get on the ship and get over here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> coming over guys so yeah and the case is worldwide it's known worldwide i'm in the netherlands i'm south african living that's... in europe and i mean it's just reaching the whole world even though it's over a decade later and you know when you have when you have government officials acting in this and then you have people sworn that are sworn and under oath lying you know i mean how how bad does it have to get, you know? Yes. And I mean, now, unfortunately for them in 2023, we're all looking. <laughs> we'll have access yeah. to information. Maybe 13 years ago, it wasn't the case or 12. But now, definitely now, everybody's watching. Everyone's aware of Ellen's case. I would hope so. If they're not, the guys might like, share, make sure everybody gets aware of it. On Twitter, we see the petition shared every day. Thank you to Grizzly Cat for doing that as well. And I think her case is actually getting traction now, which well, is great. good. Great. Yeah. I certainly hope so. So, yes, I actually hope you get many invites now. Even if other YouTubers, if you're watching this, if you're lurking, please invite the family. Invite Tom onto your show. Let's make sure we make, make noise. Yes. That's what we need. That's yes. what we need. Yes. Lieutenant Peter Pronzo from the NYPD says, thank you, Tom. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Uh, God bless you. I, I've, I've worked with a number of, number of folks from... NYPD and they're they're <laughs> excellent. They're excellent. I've worked yes. a couple of cases in New York City. Wow. <laughs> when I was with the with... FBI Behavioral Science Unit. Yes, that's amazing that you you have a lot of experience as well. So if you guys are like, oh, PI on Ellen's case, Tom has a lot of experience. You can find a lot on your Facebook page as well. I don't know if you want me to share it. <laughs> You want to share it? Oh, <laughs> you can get lots of grizzlies following you. So, <laughs> former director, special investigations and provider review at Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield, former CPL criminal investigation supervisor at Pennsylvania State Police, studied business management at Northwestern University, and the list goes on and on. Pennsylvania, huh? So, Brian Koberger. I've, <laughs> I've been very blessed. I've been very yes. blessed. And I've had the last rights four times. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> well, well my, like my father said after the second time, he said, the only thing you're proving, son, is the good Lord doesn't want you and the devil doesn't want you either. <laughs> right? <laughs> you're still here. Yes. You're still kicking, fighting, and yes. we support everything that you're doing. Thank you so much for all your passion and determination. Well, thank you. Thank you. And yes. Thank thank you. Thank all your viewers. Yes, and I'm sure that, guys, leave comments as well. Make sure you show the family and uh, Tom lots of support, lots of love. And I'm going to get to work with putting timestamps in, timestamps and all the links that you need. Okay, so make sure you click on them, follow, share, do what you can. Any any closing thoughts? I just, uh, we're, just keep us in your prayers so we get the proper decision from the courts. Yes, looking forward to that day. <laughs> Really hope so. Hope it's soon. Hope it's this year. That would be amazing. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, yes, thank you so will. much. And Grizzlies, I'll see you again very soon. And Tom, you're welcome back anytime as well. See you again soon as well. Alrighty. And uh, okay. how do I get a t-shirt? <laughs> how do you get a t-shirt? You want a Grizzly t-shirt? Are you a Grizzly? <laughs> yes. Yes. I will, I will send you the link right after this. <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs>